Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Cambridge Forum with Dana Joya discussing public poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow at 200. I'm John Barr, president of the Poetry Foundation and the moderator for our program this evening. Tonight has a manifold significance for poetry. It starts with this location. The First Parish Church is a place of reflection, a site of American ancientness often visited by poets, Longfellow prominent among them. More recently, here are some lines by Harvard poet Stephen Sandy about the graveyard just behind us. Back of the church, the busy four Scythias bow and scrape to May and all these blessed stones stiff in their careful finery of words. The mess of markers makes me go and browse. The poem concludes still speaking of the headstones. They long to be off and away. They toss and jibe in the sun, a whole regatta of black sails. They are sailing away over the lumpy green yard of time and never coming about for home until they capsize, turned turtle by boys from Central Square. Tired of holding, they are tired of holding up. Their always leaning makes me hold my tongue and sit with them a while. We heave our shoulders or our shadows on the mounds while under the hills, memorials more fine lie lip to paper lip and keep their impossible word. This evening also has significance for the Poetry Foundation. Based in Chicago, the foundation is the publisher of century-old poetry magazine. Thanks to a, general finan a generous financial gift from Ruth Lilly of the Lilly Pharmaceutical Company, the foundation now operates a major website and many other programs whose shared goal is to give poetry a more vigorous presence in American culture. What we can learn from Longfellow and his critical and popular success and what his relationship to the future American poetry will be are of great interest to the Poetry Foundation. Here is Longfellow's sonnet on Chaucer. An old man in a lodge within a park, the chamber walls depicted all around with portraitures of huntsman, hawk, and hound, and the hurt deer. He listeneth to the lark, whose song comes with the sunshine through the dark of painted glass in leaden lattice bound. He listeneth and he laugheth at the sound, then writeth in a book like any clerk. He is the poet of the dawn, who wrote the Canterbury Tales and his old age made beautiful with song. And as I read, I hear the crowing cock, I hear the note of lark and linnet, and from every page rise odors of plowed field or flowery mead. Chaucer was the first English poet to write, not in French or Latin, but in his mother tongue. When he started Canterbury Tales 700 years ago, Chaucer's challenge was to harness the rough vernacular English of his day and place it in the service of literature. More than a century ago, Longfellow did something of the same. He imported European culture and literary traditions into American verse with mastery and in so doing, created an American poetry that matched its European betters. What matters about this to the Poetry Foundation and to its mission is that Longfellow wrote a poetry that spoke both to the hound and to the hare. It was informed by the literary traditions that scholars and critics study, even as it spoke to the man on the street, the mother by the fire, the children in their lessons. That wide and popular readership gave poetry a vibrant place in the American culture of the 19th century. A vibrant place for poetry in American culture of the 21st century is of course what we hope for at the Poetry Foundation. No one can predict where poetry will go from here. Indeed, poetry is the animal that always escapes. But no one is more thoughtful on this subject than our featured speaker this evening. I think Longfellow would have been pleased to learn that Dana Gioia first encountered his work as a fellow translator of Italian poetry. Dana was impressed by the range and excellence of both Longfellow's translations and his original verse. But his admiration was followed by dismay as Dana Gioia, 
the scholar, realized the level of neglect to which Longfellow's work had fallen, both within the critical community and with the reading public. The recent renewal of interest in Longfellow was importantly due to the efforts of Dana Joya. Now serving his second term as chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, he has published three collections of poetry, including Interrogations at Noon, which won the 2002 American Book Award. His 1991 book, Can Poetry Matter?, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. He holds an MA in Comparative Literature from Harvard, as well as an MBA from Stanford. That combination may well be unique in the annals of graduate education. He was also, once upon a time, a vice president for General Foods. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Dana Joya. It is a pleasure to be here, and I especially want to thank Cambridge Forum uh, for sponsoring this event, and indeed sponsoring events for 41 years uh, in this town. But I'm also excited that we have uh, gathered here a ridiculously large percentage of the people who have preserved Longfellow's legacy. And this is in a nation where I think too often we neglect our literary, our artistic, our historical legacy. We have the uh, members of the Longfellow uh, National Historic Site, we have the Friends of the Longfellow Site, the Paul Revere uh, Memorial Association, the uh, Poetry Foundation, and we're gathered in Longfellow's own church, uh, which has you know, so nicely hosted the event. And I'm particularly grateful to, to Jim Shea, the director of the Longfellow House, a federal, fellow federal employee, uh, for helping uh, sponsor this. And I want to take this opportunity with uh, John Barr to make an announcement. Now, many of you are probably aware that over the last two years, the National Endowment for the Arts has created what will probably be the largest literary program in the history of the federal government called the Big Read. This is in response to the universal decline of reading in the United States, uh, even among college graduates, uh, you know, and those people that we think of as being the center of literary life. We have created a program that is now uh, going to be across all 50 states in 400 cities. We've created a daily national radio show in which books are read aloud during rush hour. Uh, books like The Great Gatsby, Grapes of Wrath, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, uh, to, to Kill a Mockingbird, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And it's been focused essentially on, if I may uh, speak bluntly, creating positive social pressure to read. We have positive, pos you know, positive social pressure to watch American Idol, uh, you know, to you know, change the width of our ties if we're men, but why not reading great books? This has been enormously successful. It's being embraced by tens of millions of people across the United States. But there's one thing lacking in this program, poetry. And so it is with great pleasure that tonight I announce a different sort of twist on the Big Read program. This is going to be a program for literary landmarks, those few irreplaceable locations in the United States where communities through their own effort have preserved the home or the working place of a great writer uh, so that those uh, facilities have an opportunity to create programs for their community so that they understand the local literary heritage, especially for poets. The first of these, and uh, I like to have visuals, uh, is the poetry of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, that we will begin with a $15,000 grant to the Wayside Inn in Sudbury to create a community-based program. Uh, And I look forward to the Longfellow House in Cambridge uh, following with an application, I hope, and, and the Longfellow uh, uh, House in Portland, Maine. Uh, we hope this will be the first of uh, programs. And I'd like to thank uh, John Barr and Steve Young of the Poetry Foundation, without whose partnership this would not have been possible. <laughs> 
So uh, congratulations to Sudbury, and we look forward to working with you to, to make the Wayside Inn uh, even more uh, valuable to its community. Uh, now that the federal portion of the program is over, I'm going to take my coat off. Uh, <laughs> in the strong faith that the Republic will not falter as a result, and talk about the poetry of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, 2007 is the bicentennial year of Longfellow, and the year has been the occasion for many uh, literary and civic celebrations, some local, some national, both in the United States and in Europe. There have been lectures, there's been conferences, there's been readings, uh, there's even been a postage stamp. Longfellow, uh, if you remember, your philately, was the first American poet ever honored on a postage stamp, uh, 1940, on a one cent stamp. It says everything about the American economy that he was honored uh, earlier this year at a 39 cent stamp, which is already too uh, little to pay postage. Uh, but he is now the only American poet ever to be honored twice on a postage stamp. Now, anniversaries are in some sense arbitrary measurements, but they do provide an occasion for reflection. Uh, what is an author's legacy? What is an author's current status 100, 150, 200 years uh, later? And amid the recognition and remembrance that we honor our great writers with, there also comes the opportunity to reconsider what remains of them, what is still valuable about them. It would be hard to imagine a writer for whom this exercise of reconsideration would be more valuable than Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a major American cultural figure, not merely a poet, but a dominant cultural figure who spent the 20th century not really being reevaluated or even downgraded, but almost totally being ignored uh, by the intellectual establishment. Now, this may be the course of things for someone who was once so famous and so central that they can, in a sense, be taken for granted. But now that we are in the 21st century, I think we have an interesting opportunity to reevaluate him freshly as a poet, as a cultural figure, and even as an individual of symbolic importance to the country. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that he is an author, and I'm talking about in an age where every day hundreds of critical articles are being published. He is a great American author for whom there really is no critical consensus. There are stereotypes, yes. There are prejudices about him, good or bad to be certain, but mostly we have indifference, and ignorance. Uh, very few people, including very few literary scholars, have actually read his work today in any depth. Uh, they know him probably as the author of a few short poems, and I would be willing to risk that many, and this is literary people, uh, know Longfellow mostly through quotations, the patter of little feet, ships crossing in the night, uh, listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And he exists uh, sort of ineradicably in our culture, but sometimes almost to the point of anonymity. I would guess that if I took five or six famous quotes from Longfellow, most people would identify them as folk expressions rather than literary quotations. Now, I want to now read a little excerpt to show you how misleading I think these stereotypes are. There is a poem, uh, most famous probably in Sudbury, Massachusetts, 
uh, called The Landlord's Tale, also known as Paul Revere's Ride. Most uh, native English speaking Americans probably know the first stanza by heart. And thank God, because it's probably the only reason that they know when the Revolutionary War started. <laughs> Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. The truly uh, literary probably know the second stanza. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, Hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One if by land, and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm to every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and arm. This, probably more than any other passage, is the stereotype of Longfellow, which is interesting if you think about it, is a tale told by an adult to other adults, which begins with, listen, my children, and you shall uh, hear. So it's, in a sense, it's a tale within a tale just in terms of the rhetoric. But what I would say is that if you, I'm going to read you now two stanzas that I'll read you the first one so you know what's going on. But I bet if you read the second one to a room full of PhD candidates in American literature, virtually none of them would recognize it as Longfellow. First, the one that I think would give it away. Uh, then he climbed the tower of Old North Church by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead and startled the pigeons from their perch on the somber rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade by the trembling ladder steep and tall to the highest window in the wall where he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. And here's the, the, a stanza that I don't think most people would recognize, but I think gives you a sense of how good Longfellow is when he's hot. Bene and this is compliments Mr. Barr's uh, Stephen Sandy poem. Beneath in the churchyard lay the dead in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in a silence so deep and still that he could hear, like a sentinel's tread, the watchful night wind as it went, creeping along from tent to tent and seeming to whisper, all is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead. For suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. That is exquisite uh, poetry. And all the more surprising for being, as it were, a meditative interlude in a narrative poem. Now, what I'm s saying here is that the situation for, if I could create a fictive term, Longfellow studies, uh, is a problem, a challenge, but it's also an interesting opportunity. We have a tabla rasa in which to reconstruct the portrait of a great American author. And we now, really for the first time in nearly half a century, see some interesting things being sketched upon it. Uh, First of all, uh, Charles Calhoun's superb biography of, of Longfellow, which I think is the first new biography in over half a century since Newton Arvin's. Uh, I've been told that Mr. Calhoun is in the audience tonight. Is, he, is that indeed true? Well, congratulations on this incredible book. Uh, uh, which Next is the Library of America edition of Longfellow, which rather than reprinting the same, you know, uh, chestnuts uh, for 50 years, and in some of these paperbacks have been reprinted for 50 years, I'm not making this up, there's a, you know, an ample new selection with w a wonderful scholarly apparatus. There's a superb book published by Harvard Press, uh, 
Joan Shelley Rubin's Songs of Ourselves, The Uses of Poetry in America, which is the best book, I think, perhaps ever written on, this, on the sociological and cultural position of poetry from the 19th century up to the um, early 20th century. Now, as some of you have found out, I myself have occasionally written on Longfellow, a unduly long chapter in the Columbia history of American poetry, as well as other places. Uh, and so I think that, you know, while I am certainly biased, I'm also entitled to a personal opinion. And mine is that Longfellow seems surprisingly relevant, startlingly relevant to contemporary Amer American culture as it moves beyond the print-centered culture of the 20th century into a period of competing technologies, many of them auditory and speech-based rather than print-based. Uh, we are moving into what some uh, commentators have called a secondary oral culture, a culture in which people can read, but some often choose to communicate through speech, uh, be it by cell phone or um, you know, audio book. And reevaluating Longfellow in such a time uh, is quite interesting because it raises not simply the issues of his own personal legacy, but larger issues about the nature of poetry and its place in contemporary society. Now, in order to answer this, in some ways you have to ask what is poetry and what are the human purposes of poetry? Now, these are huge questions. It would take us probably at least 15 minutes to answer each of them adequately. Uh, but uh, I at least want to touch on them. Now, I once heard a very distinguished uh, professor of poetry, when asked to define poetry, said that poetry was language examining the limits of language's ability to signify meaning. I thought that was an extraordinarily elegant definition, but I also thought that it probably describes about one one hundredth of one percent of the poetry that's been written on the planet. Uh, I don't think that describes the Iliad, the Aeneid, uh, any of the traditional epics. I don't think it, do, I think what it is is a very late modernist definition of one of the many wonderful things that poetry can do. What I would offer as a working definition for the purposes of this lecture is that poetry is a language. It is a special way of talking that exists in every language on the planet that invites and rewards a special way of listening. Uh, it is, originates in speech, even if today it's largely communicated in writing. It is ancient, it is indeed primal, it is the oldest human art form. Going back to a time in human history when what we think of today as song, dance, and poetry were one interrelated kind of performative art. It differs in, uh, intrinsically from conceptual analytical speech, the kind of, of speech where we're trying to talk about ideas. Because poetry is by its nature holistic. Uh, it simultaneously addresses the intellect, the emotions, the intuition, memory, imagination, the physical senses and the body in a way which all of those ways of communicating are not taken apart, but holistically kept together. And if you think about this, the word poesis in Greek means to make, where analysis comes from the sense of taking it apart. This is the creative, intuitive, preconceptual, and universal type of human speech. We've been taught uh, in postmodern times that there are no human universals. Well, there are many, and one of them is called poetry. It is also highly mnemonic. When Robert Frost was asked to define poetry, he said, it is a way of remembering that which it would impoverish us to forget. A way of remembering those things which are too important to forget. And indeed, in societies before writing, poetry was the way they remembered those things that were essential. Now, the role of the poet has changed as society has changed. And by the time Longfellow came along, poetry was not so much the, the 
memory of everything a people needed to know historically, culturally, religiously, but it became in a way of embodying those central things, some of which the poet himself or herself was the co-creator of in unforgettable, moving language. And nowhere is this truer in American literature than in the career of Longfellow, who created many of the central American myths. And I use myth in the high sense of the mythos, the stories by which people explain their origins. Now, I would speculate that poetry has a physical uh, power in it. Since ancient times, philosophers have been suspicious of poetry because it creates a kind of sense of enchantment. I believe that poetry, at least traditional poetry, auditory poetry, creates a mild hypnotic spell. Uh, and then it does this through meter and through other artifice so that it lowers our defenses, it raises our attention, and increases our retention. In anthropological terms then, poetry is an oral technology that is a parallel language to everyday speech that differentiates itself by announcing itself as artifice. You can hear a poem being different from speech uh, from the moment that it begins. And you'll notice that even writers who write a kind of visual free verse, when they read it aloud, try somehow to create that differentiating, differentiating artifice. Now, what are the purposes of poetry? Wallace Stevens, I think, had a wonderful thing. He says, the purpose of poetry is to increase man's happiness, um, which may not be the, the immediately evident to a high school student having to write a paper on a poem, uh, but I think is at the center, which is that the center of all the arts is pleasure, is delight. But I would broaden it and to say that the purpose of poetry is to instruct, delight, remember, console, and inspire. Now, I don't mean inspire in the sense of lofty thoughts or whatever, but to inspire us, fill us again with life, to reawaken and revive our humanity, to reanimate us. Kafka said that a book is the ax with which we break open the frozen seas within us. And that, I think, is the purpose of literature, to, to by enchanting us, by having us lower our defenses, to reawaken us to the fullness of our own potential. Now, no one poem or poet needs to perform all of these functions at once, uh, but I list them because I want to point out the capacious nature of the art of poetry. A poem can, in principle, address any aspect of human experience, and poetry itself can address any audience, from kids, to PhD candidates. Now, not every poem does this, not every poet does this, but the art itself has that potential, and indeed history illustrates that potential. To think of, the, of anything less than that is to be reductive about one of the great central human arts. Now, we need to remember the broad mission of poetry in approaching Longfellow. He was a learned man and a famous scholar, but his poetic mission was populist in the best sense of the word. He sought to reach a broad, mixed audience without talking down to them. Excellence without condescension, I think, was fundamental to, to Longfellow and the great poets of the 19th century in the United States. Uh, his sensibility, luckily, perfectly matched the project. Now, if we look at uh, the five major uh, 19th century American poets, and one could expand the list or contract, but I think five is a, is a pretty conventional measure, Longfellow, Emerson, Poe, Whitman, and Dickinson, we see five radically different writers, not only in terms of style, but also in their vision of the art and its social and cultural function. Uh, once again, this single observation could be the, the subject of an entire lecture, but the contrasts should be obvious to anybody who knows these poets' work. 
Whitman's prophetic voice differs from Poe's uh, dreamy aesthetic perspective, just as Dickinson's contemplative perspective differs from Longfellow's more civic aims. Whitman's nationalism seems alien to Poe's deliberate placelessness or to Longfellow's universalist internationalism and so on. So it brings us to the thing of how do we define the individuality of Longfellow, and I think it wouldn't be bad to start the way that his contemporaries would have seen him. Uh, Longfellow was America's best-selling author, period, in any genre, in any form. He was the nation's first internationally famous poet. Now, Irving had a little bit of an audience. Other Cooper had audiences. But Longfellow was so famous that when he went to England, you know, Queen Victoria, Prince Albert wanted to meet him. And when he went to Queen Victoria, there's an entry in her diary that when he came to visit her, her servants hid behind the curtains and hid in various places to get a glimpse of him. She said, she remarked, no other visitor to Windsor Castle had ever evoked such interest. Uh, and she was surprised at her servants, but it's even more interesting. Not only was the, he seemed to be the most famous man from the servant's perspective uh, ever to visit Windsor Castle, but think about this. Queen Victoria and her servants both loved and read the same poet. She said, I have made inquiries and, and have discovered that many of his poems are familiar to them, I think was the way that she said. Uh, he was popular among all classes. He was an internationalist, a distinguished translator and teacher. He was a spokesman for the uh, New England liberal tradition. He was a public figure who was progressive, uh, but not revolutionary. And this is the thing that I think probably damned him and probably made your biography so hard to write. He was eminently respectable. You really can't find anything that Longfellow did that was really awful. I mean, he was a, he was a, a wonderful man with a genius for friendship and charity. When Edgar Allan Poe repeatedly attacked him and, uh, and accused him of plagiarism, and people wanted to, to, you know, to pick up lances on, on Longfellow's behalf, he said, no, no, this is a sad man. Let's, let's not pick on him. I mean, can you imagine Norman Mailer saying that? <laughs> uh, uh, this list shows one thing. Is there any poet today that you could make some of these claims? America's best-selling author, internationally famous, popular among all classes, uh, uh, you know, a spokesman for a whole uh, culture's tradition. Uh, if, you, if you tried to find somebody like this, you'd be, you probably would have to go to pop music and probably not even America. You'd probably say, well, Paul McCartney? Uh, uh, and even Bob Dylan, you know, probably, you know, wouldn't qualify. There's something uh, heroic in a cultural sense about Longfellow's position. Uh, Longfellow's good fortune in the 19th century was to excel at the forms and genres and styles his age preferred. And he had four kinds of mastery that I think gave him popular appeal. He was you know, almost unsurpassed on the short popular lyric. I'll talk about that in a moment. He was, I mean, really unsurpassed and may remain unsurpassed as the master of the long narrative. He uh, also was the one person who could write didactic lyrics, you know, like the Psalm of Life, which is the first work of American literature ever translated into Chinese where it became Im immensely popular. And he had an astonishing metrical mastery. There's probably no American poet who is his equal. I think W.H. Auden, uh, among British poets in, of the last two centuries, is the one person, maybe, maybe Tennyson, that, was his, that had the same range. Uh, and on top of that, he had two achievements uh, you know, for the, the elite, which he had mastered a more complicated literary style, and he had this sort of mastery of translation. But if you look at the four things which made him famous, these are all things that the 20th century uh, you know, didn't find interesting. As modernism came along, these were exactly the forms and the genres. Uh, and so you think of Goethe at the late, end of the 18th century saying, you know, there are four Naturformen, natural forms of literature, the narrative, the lyric, the dramatic, and the didactic. 
essentially, modernism was almost entirely about the lyric, or maybe in the case of something like Pound, a kind of didactic lyric uh, in the cantos. And so, you know, it's sort of like going to the Olympics and discovering those things that you've trained for are no longer, you know, uh, being conducted. Now, the popularity, especially the popularity outside official literary classes, also became a stumbling block in the 20th century. The modernism and, uh, and the various manifestations of that made us suspicious of any kind of artistic excellence that spoke to a general audience. Uh, the split between highbrow and lowbrow, and eventually highbrow, middlebrow and lowbrow, between high art and low art, became really defining uh, movements, defining gestures in the 20th century. Uh, and even though they are being dismantled uh, in the 21st century by, by literary scholars, uh, they remain very powerful in our thinking. But what we have to remember is how recent and how time-bound those concepts are. Uh, uh, we know this from popular art. Is the godfather high art, low art, middle brow, high brow, you know, or is it just a masterpiece that lots of people for lots of reasons can do? And what would you, th I mean, how would you make sense of the highbrow versus lowbrow distinction uh, looking at the careers of Shakespeare, of Verdi, of Michelangelo, of Bernini, of Sorwana, of Pushkin? Are they less good because uh, they, were, they appeal to all classes? This, these sort of divisions are very much, uh, I think, historical and divisions which are no longer terribly useful to us. To speak only of poetry, I think we need to recover an appreciation for the richness and the depth of this populist tradition. Now, I'm not saying that we make it better than anything else. It is neither better nor worse than other traditions, but it is different. And the differences are not necessarily defects. What we can see in the 21st century, which perhaps we couldn't see as much in the middle of the 20th, is that this tradition of poetry is performative. Uh, the medium is aural rather than visual. And popular poetry is characterized by clarity, simplicity, emotional directness, syntactic linearity, smoothness, overt musicality, and you might even go so far as metrical symmetry, symmetry where there's a kind of a tune that you hear uh, almost like a song that comes and comes again in a very strict musical pattern. And there are at least a dozen great poets in English that cannot be understood in any other way. People like Robert Herrick or Robert Burns, Whittier, Hausman, Kipling, Stevenson, Langston Hughes. Uh, if you remember, when F.L. Matheson edited his Oxford Book of American Poetry in 1950, how many poems by Langston Hughes did he put in? Zero because Hughes was part of this populist tradition. It was beneath, now Hughes is you know, largely because of identity uh, poetry and all the scholarly interest that follows that, is considered you know, one of the major figures of the 20th century. And it's simply because we began to evaluate Hughes on what Hughes did versus on what he didn't do. Um, and I think even Hardy you know, could be placed in this. But this is where Longfellow belongs. These poets and their song-like poems do not, generally invite critical analysis or close line-by-line -line readings. But when you look at them from a slightly broader perspective, uh, they are extremely interesting to, uh, to think about and write about. But you have to take a broader cultural perspective. Uh, if you think that the, of the purpose of criticism being to demonstrate that you are smarter than your students uh, or you're smarter than the other critics, Longfellow offers very few opportunities for self-promotion. But the continuing appeal of this work over centuries to broad and diverse audiences remind us that the main purpose of poetry is not necessarily to provide employment for critics. That's, that's a nice side benefit when it happens, but a poem can be a great poem without necessarily uh, inviting a critical essay. So this observation leads me back to the, my opening question. What opportunities does the Longfellow Bicentennial provide? Perhaps in addition to reconsidering and reevaluating this great American poet's legacy, our investigation can also 
use his example to reconsider the full potential of poetry itself. As we enter this new millennium in a global electronic culture full of cultural, political, economic division, there are some things to be learned from Longfellow. His internationalism, his tolerance, his generosity, the liberality of his imagination, his respect for a broad and democratic audience, his commitment to civic life, and even his interest in poetry as a tool of education that sometimes uh, goes into the didactic, he seems a very attractive model in an increasingly atomized, commercialized, and dumbed-down society. Likewise, his works remind us of the broader possibilities of poetry, to tell our stories, to commemorate our history, to sing our songs, to teach uh, the lessons of human experience in ways which invite, include people, rather than exclude them. This is not the only model for poetry, but it seems to me that the art would be poorer if this were not one of its possibilities. Now let me end with a short poem by Longfellow himself so the poet can have the last word. This is what would be a populist lyric. It's something that's rarely anthologized. In fact, it's not in most of the collections of Longfellow. To me, it's a gem. It's called The Tide Rises, The Tide Falls. The tide rises, the tide falls. The twilight darkens, the curlew calls. Along the sea sands, damp and brown, the traveler hastens toward the town, and the tide rises, the tide falls. Darkness settles on roofs and walls, but the sea, the sea in the darkness calls. The little waves with their soft white hands efface the footprints on the sands, and the tide rises, the tide falls. The morning breaks, the steeds in their stalls stamp and neigh as the hostler calls. The day returns, but never more returns the traveler to the shore. And the tide rises, the tide falls. Thank you very much. Uh, one thinks of Whitman when uh, Leaves of Grass came out. Uh, he was a, a journalist and he knew how to promote a book and he wrote anonymous book reviews raving about Leaves of Grass. Uh, I can't imagine Longfellow doing that based on your descriptions and, and I'm wondering, was the private man behind the public face someone you would love to have dinner with? Well, I would have loved to have had dinner with Longfellow, not only for the pleasure of his company, but he apparently had the best wine cellar in Cambridge, you know, which would, you know, for any, you know, would have been reason enough to visit him. He seems to me, in almost every sense, uh, an exemplary man. He clearly had a genius for friendship, and the best minds in Boston and Cambridge, you know, you know craved and enjoyed his company. So, yes, I would have loved to have, to have met Longfellow and, and sh shared a meal and a glass of wine. Thank you. Dana, if you'd remain at the podium, I think people will have other questions. I might ask one more and then, uh, and then open it up to our guests. Um, modernism. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Uh, sometime after Longfellow's uh, ascent to the highest levels of American fame, uh, a few people in London at the early years of the 20th century uh, published uh, poems like The Wasteland and The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. In fact, those poems were first published in Poetry Magazine, which is now published and has been published by the Poetry Foundation. Tina, could you comment, uh, after reading The Wasteland, after The Wasteland came out by T.S. Eliot, was it possible to think about the work of Longfellow in the same way? Yes and no. Uh, what happens in, a lot of times in cultural change is the law of unintended consequence. By trying to accomplish one thing, you know, you end up doing something else. I mean, we see it in, in life all the time. No one, just, you know, planned to have smog, 
you know, when they built cars, but it happened. It was an unintended consequence. Modernism was in a very strange situation because people like Pound and Eliot saw themselves uh, in some ways as, as jump, walking into the cultural position of Longfellow or you know, these, you know, these great cultural figures. Ezra Pound was, in fact, Longfellow's great nephew. Uh, and, uh, but in order, to, in a sense, to make that cultural space available, they had to dislodge uh, poetry from that. And there's a thing, no one's ever really written about this at any length, but if you look at the, uh, the textbooks that came out by the second generation of modernists, the Brooks and Warren Understanding Poetry is the classic example of this, they all begin with an opening chapter, because they're, they're thinking, they're talking to 18-year-old uh, uh, students, and they'll give a poem that they think that these kids like. It's usually the psalm of life. And then they'll say, you know, then they'll begin to destroy it. They'll sort of say, if you think that's a poem, you're a wimp. Are you man enough for modernism? And it's this kind of gesture you see again and again in these books, which in a sense they have to discredit the popular tradition in order to make room for the, 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 the modernist, the coterie tr tradition. It may have been the necessary cost of making a place in the culture for them, but I think what the consequences of this was that the entry points for most readers of poetry, those things which most people found as a way of, of falling in love with the art, were systematically, over the next 50 years, eliminated from the curriculum, along with the central way that poetry has been studied through the entire history of humanity which is memorization and recitation. Uh, that is, a, once again, a universal from China to Rome to England to Des Moines until this, and it was replaced by the written analysis of poetry because the poems they were, they were giving students were very challenging poems. I happen to think that modernism is the greatest period of American poetry, but the achievements came at a cultural price. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the microphone is open. Uh, please come forward with a question. While other people think of their questions, I have, I have a couple, but I'll restrain myself to one. And it has to do with the, the culture of the 21st century that you have described as giving an opening for a new appreciation, a return of Longfellow. In some, you describe this as a more oral culture, but in some ways it's an even more visual culture. And I wonder if you could comment on imagery in Longfellow and how the, this may interact with the visual yeah. culture. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think what you're seeing is a division in culture. The visual culture is largely image-based and movement-based. The uh, language is increasingly becoming part of oral culture. And so, I mean, uh, there was a passage I didn't read because I, I didn't want to go on too long, but it was uh, the dis Longfellow's description of the prairies from Evangeline, which I think is one of the great moments of American nature writing. And it's absolutely cinematic. It's no uh, coincidence that probably, I don't know, I would guess 50, 75 films have been made out of Longfellow's poetry because it is, you know, it is, he's fundamentally a, a myth maker and a scene uh, painter uh, as part of his, you know, his, his poetic ambition. So you know, I think that in, in a sense uh, that he works well into both the sensibility and the technology of the 21st century, which is one of the pleasures about talking about him on the radio this evening. Well, I was thinking about your question, who has the widespread worldwide popularity of Longfellow? And I can't think of a poet, but I think of J.K. Rowling, because the, her books have been read by so many people, so many ages, grandparents talking to grandkids. She, she, and I had a literary friend the other day who sort of dissed her writing style. Well, uh, she reaches a lot of people. Uh, the question I wanted to ask you was, what you did tonight was you put Longfellow across. The way you read it is the exact opposite of da 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 And my question is, is there a way to, 
we teach people this special way of talking, and your definition of poetry, a special way of talking that you rewards you if you have a special way of listening. Yeah, well, can, that's, can a, that, that's a, very, a very sophisticated question, and it's a good one, I think, with Longfellow, because verse is a technique. You know, verse is a way of arranging language so that it has an expressive effect that is in some ways uh, only semi-consciously felt by the listeners. And you, what you need to do is, is to recite a poem the way someone plays jazz. You always have the beat in jazz, but you play with the beat. And so somebody who's just playing with the beat but you don't know what meter is in is not a very good jazz musician, and somebody who you, is very metronomic is not. And so what you want to do is to be able to hear the meter, but to hear the way the meter and the syntax play against each other. And uh, that was something I think that people probably were much better at, uh, both as silent readers and as public readers in the 19th century than that we are today, because it was part of education and part of public culture. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I think will, will revive the popularity of poetry is when in our school systems we combine the analysis, which is good, with the performance. And one of the nice things about that is that sometimes the student you have in class who's the worst student possible in doing analysis of the poem becomes the star when they begin to recite poems. And, and suddenly you create another way of engaging poetry, another way of achieving academic success. And I think that we need to have a, a system of, of education for reading and for literature which includes rather than excludes people while still being demanding. Sir. I um, actually have two questions. One is that uh, one of the best times that ever occurred in my life is when my uh, uncle visited here. We went to the Longfellow house. As a high school student, he memorized Longfellow. Uh, and he wanted to have the opportunity to be there. So one of the things I wanted to do is just to congratulate the whole process that keeps that house going. <laughs> it's a wonderful resource. And, and uh, he uh, came from a very poor family. Uh, he was a sharecropper in the South went to a public high school, but he learned Longfellow, and he thought that was the epitome of American culture. And for him to be able to come to a place like Cambridge and visit at no cost, yeah. essentially, that was great. Well, the first time, uh, uh, My, John, John Barr was right to say that the first time I really became seriously interested in Longfellow when I was doing Italian translations and putting together a comprehensive uh, anthology of, of Italian verse and translation, but my earliest memories of Longfellow are from my mother, who is a working class Mexican woman in Los Angeles reciting Longfellow from memory. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, in, in these poems like this. And so he was part of my oral childhood culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that leads to the question, though, of preservation. And I guess the question that, that I'd like to formulate is, should we have a canon that all students, let's say high school students, have to learn uh, and poetry, American poetry, of which Longfellow would certainly be a part? Uh, or should we try to tr encourage young people to learn their own poem, their own poetic sense, and create whatever they do that may or may not be very good poetry? Well, that's actually a practical question because uh, the National Endowment for the Arts and the Poetry Foundation are co-sponsoring a national high school poetry recitation contest and uh, one of the questions was, can students do their own poems? We felt that actually it was, a more, it was a, a more level playing field where they would memorize and recite the words of any other you know, published poet of their choice. We put together a huge uh, you know, anthology of possibilities, both in print and on the web. Uh, and it's a way, in a sense, of students, they don't have to be good writers to compete. Because there's something to be learned from memorizing and reciting poetry it's about public speaking, it's about how you present yourself, about, uh, you know, about all kinds of things which are very practical life skills that are uh, quite different from literary creative skills. But that being said, I think we should encourage students both to read, to memorize, to recite, but also write their own work and, ex and explore their own creative ability. So a good education system would do both. Next question, I'd just like to welcome our radio listeners. Uh, you're listening to Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion with Dana Joya of the National Endowment for the Arts on the place of poetry in the 21st century. Hello, my name is Alfred Riley. I'm from Waltham. And uh, my question or comment might be a little different. When I retired from my job, I was a physicist, and I took up poetry and music as a sort of hobby. And I'd done mostly writing it rather than reading it, but I read quite a bit. 
But there's one thing that bothers me. I'm a student of Celtic history and culture, among others. And I find that I don't think that uh, language or nationality are the are good ways to describe poetry. Like English poetry, very few of the people who wrote it are English. If you start with the English and Anglo-Saxon invasion of Britain, Britain being an Irish word, a thousand years went by before anybody showed up and he was French, Chaucer. Then he had to wait till the Welsh took over the government, the Tudors and the Henry VIII and them seventh. And then we had a burst of poetry and most of them were Celts. And if you look at every time you look into it, you find it more off. But it's not just Celts. And uh, I find that it's very, they have a term Anglo-Irish poetry, and that means poetry written by an Irishman in English. But then they say English poetry, and you find out if you study it, no, the people writing it are in English. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's annoying. I think Longfellow would have agreed with you. Uh, I mean, after all, the Song of, of Hiawatha, as he would have pronounced it, is written in a Finnish meter. Uh, Evangeline is written in a Greek and Roman meter. Uh, I am, uh, I don't have a drop of English blood in me. You know, I am Italian, Mexican, Native American, but I believe I own the English language with an equal share of any member of the House of Lords or any member, you know, of the, you know, of the Mayflower uh, Society, because languages are these realities that transcend race and culture and nationality, and they belong to the speakers and the lovers of that language. And it's, it is quite interesting that sometimes the greatest poets in a language are people who have one foot inside the culture and one foot outside of it. I mean, think of somebody like Constantine Cavafy, uh, who spoke Greek with a British accent because he was partially raised, I believe, in Liverpool. But that sort of inside and outside perspective, I think, sometimes is what, it, what really gives a poet kind of greatness, the way that Yeats straddled both, you know, both the British and the Irish cultures. Well, you know, in about 2002, they published a survey of the publishers, critics, and outstanding poets in the English language. And they wanted them to name the 100 top poetry, poets and writers in English in the 20th century. And the first seven were Irish, 33 of the first of the 100 were Irish, and in the whole list were very few English people. Yeah. I'm saying it's very misleading to call it English poetry, and it's annoying as anything to me. Well, it's, it's English language poetry, so. But, you know, I'm, I'm personally delighted that we have a new poet laureate in the United States named Charles Simic, who was born in Serbia, uh, yeah. in Belgrade, or then called Yugoslavia. Well, I don't mind if they call it <laughs> Serbian poetry. I get tired of Irish writings being called English poetry. Mm -hmm. And when you had to name someone who was charismatic enough to be an overall star, you named an Irishman, McCartney. Or a Liverpoolian. Well, that's, that's part of Ireland. People have, have many been? identities, so, yeah. so, so thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Dana, Dana, you thank get my you. Point. Yeah. And our next question, please. As, as far as I know, the, the last poet to uh, be honored with a stamp on some type of centennial was Ogden Nash. And I, I grew up on the poetry of Ogden Nash uh, through my family, uh, mainly through the pages of the New Yorker and so forth. But in the course of uh, the celebration, I, I discovered that uh, he was actually very popular in uh, the so-called hinterlands or the provinces. Apparently, he made numerous tours through uh, middle America, Kansas, Texas, and so forth and so on. Anyway, I wondered if you would uh, make a few comments well, about it's his interesting, position. It's um, interesting you say this. You know, my mother, never opened a copy of The New Yorker in her life, not even when I was published in it. Uh, uh, probably especially not then. Uh, but she, you know, as this working class Mexican woman in LA, knew Ogden Nash by heart. She used to read me Custard the Dragon. And, you know, and, and she would quote things like, you know, uh, let's see, a primeval termite knocked on wood, tasted it, and found it good. <laughs> and that is why your cousin May fell through the parlor floor today. Uh, or when called by a panther, don't answer. Uh, you know, so no, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Nash... Andy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and Nash is one of the few 20th century poets who made a living entirely through verse. Uh, and I think he's, he's a wonderful poet, very, you know, quite 
He, the interesting thing about Nash too is Nash is actually an experimental poet. If you look at what he does, nobody else ever played the same comic tricks before. I mean, he did all kinds of interesting things with rhymes, uh, neologisms, rhyming uh, prose passages, uh, deliberate, deliberate mispronunciations and things like that. I mean, he's not a poet who could range outside of of the comic, you know, for a, a you know a broader you know uh, uh, sort of representation of human experience, you know. But I think he's a is a an absolutely terrific poet, and and you know a uh, misunderstood and that people don't understand the sheer originality that he had. So I was I was glad to see the Ogden Nash stamp too, as well as there's also been a good biography just published of Nash. Our next question, please. Thank you for your comments tonight. Enjoyed them. I wanted to, as I was listening, I was thinking about something that was hovering around what you were saying. When you, I think you were alluding to Father Ong when you talked about secondary orality. And I think maybe, for me, Longfellow is a rhetorical poet in the same sense that modernists were not. And I think that in the postmodern world, and I'd like you to comment on this, what Longfellow could mean to us today with the internet and all, is a, maybe a kind of revival of a multicultural voice. We see this lately in the Gina Six and what the, what the whole black population has done in terms of getting our attention focused on what happened in Louisiana. I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, a there's, a, there's a lot of interesting ideas that you brought forward. I mean, uh, I think Walter Ong is one of the great literary thinkers, uh, you know, who died a few years ago, who really uh, is explaining some of the cultural changes that are going on in terms of our apprehension of language. Um, and one of the points that, that Ong makes, uh, and several other people do this, is when you see something on a page, you see it outside of yourself. But those things you hear, you hear inside yourself. There, there's an interiority uh, and perhaps even a subjectivity that you experience there. And it's true of music. It's one of the reasons music moves us so much. And although you know, Longfellow is highly rhetorical, as indeed I think almost all 19th century poets are, I mean, even Whitman replaces meter with a very elaborate kind of musical rhetoric, uh, they are primarily poets who work on the auditory imagination. And uh, I think actually, uh, you know, Longfellow has more in common with Snoop Dogg you know, than perhaps Robert Creeley, you know, or a, po a poet who's largely a visual poet, because they're in a sense, you know, trying to, you know, create a sort of a verbal spell. Uh, one thing that you, we, we learned about rap, you know, learned from rap is that form loves to revel in doing tricks. I mean, the more elaborate the rhyme, the more elaborate the syncopation, the more fun it is in some cases for both the audience and for the poet. That's one of the things that Ogden Nash plays with in terms of comic verse. And I think that, you know, that although Longfellow is not a show-off poet in the way that, let's say, Auden is, who said, you know, oh, where are you going, said reader to writer, that valley is fatal when furnaces burn, yonder's the midden whose odors will mat, you know, these kind of, these sort of absolutely, you know, you know, complicated things, Longfellow is always there, you know, sort of with this kind of, creating a kind of mesmeric kind of rhythm, which is one of the reasons why his work uh, performs so well in auditory terms. Please. Hi. My name is Zinovi Weyman, and I have a rhetoric question. Uh, does the audience and you uh, speakers know that uh, there was a great Russian writer, Ivan Bunin, uh, who was a mostly a prose writer, and uh, he attained an immense popularity in uh, uh, Russia. Uh, it was so high that in the Soviet school, he was not allowed uh, to read. And uh, he got his Nobel Prize for translation. Uh, he pronounced it Gaiavata, for Gaiavata, uh, Hiavata, as you say, uh, song translation. Nobel Prize Committee uh, said that because of Longfellow, uh, great translation into the uh, Russian language, he is honored with this prize. Well, I, I did not know that that was in the Nobel Society. How interesting. Um, I did meet in Moscow a professor at the university there who had translated Evangeline in the Soviet period, and it sold so well he was able to buy a car. 
with the royalties, and so he was the only member of the faculty that had a car. And so, I, you know, so there was, you know, the Longfellow, you know, remains popular. I think one of the interesting things about Russian poetry, and I don't know if it is the only national literature, but it's certainly the preeminent national literature that entered modernism without losing uh, sort of metrical invention and form as a central preoccupation. You know, and so you, you know, you, you know, these great, you know, these the equivalent poems to the wastelands and the, the cantos and Patterson and Russian are rhymed and metrical, and that's really quite interesting because it shows you, in a sense, how many of these decisions that we think in English are are intrinsic to modernism are really culturally dependent. So thank you. I was uh, I learned something, you know, about you know. Um, I was hoping, uh, you know, as someone who's interested in modern languages, that you could speak to. Um, Longfellow in his own study of modern languages. I think one thing that's impressed me in looking at his life is that he went to Europe and learned so many different languages so quickly and seemed adept then at translating into those languages. And then, of course, I don't know how to the extent that he knew of his works being translated into other languages. But I always think of someone when they write as having their native language inform them as to feeling and semantics and rhythm and musicality and all that. And I was wondering if the quality of his translations were something that because translation can be uneven. Yeah. Well, this is this is a very, a very central question, and I'll see if I can answer it quickly. Um, Mr. Cal Professor Calhoun, maybe you can help me. Uh, Longfellow knew somewhere between eight and eleven languages, uh, but I think he had a reading or basic grasp, and I think he translated from some languages he didn't read fluently. But he, you know, somewhere between, I think that's that's insofar as I can calculate it from his published work. Uh, and from, the, and from you know, other things you know, that, that are there. What he did is really three things that are really quite interesting. One is because he, was, he essentially was trained uh, in romance philology and published in romance philology before he wrote poetry as an adult. By the time that he, in a sense, returned to poetry, his imagination was thoroughly saturated uh, in Spanish, Italian, French, uh, and then secondarily in the Germanic uh, uh, meters, plus he knew Latin and Greek. There is no other formal poet in English except perhaps W.H. Auden, who uh, used so many forms without ever making blank verse a central form. He, he uh, essentially was almost universal in the forms that he did. And that's, it's a, now, that's a technical point that you probably won't notice unless you go through and look at these things. But you know, he worked as easily in dactyls and trochees, uh, in anapests. He wrote free verse. Uh, he wrote quantitative verse. Um, and in fact, you know, one of the things that Matthew Arnold, uh, who was very anti-American, hated about Longfellow was that Longfellow was the first poet to write a great poem in English in dactylic hexameter, something that Brits had been trying for 400 years without success, including Matthew Arnold. Uh, and so you see the mastery of, you know, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, but you know, th this, he, he made it absolutely natural. Um, the Song of Hiawatha, where he's taking a Finnish meter. And so he, his own style is international in a way that almost separates him from every major poet in English. He introduced an enormous number of meters, stanza patterns, uh, forms into English, and he also translated. Now, the translations, I think, are uneven. Um, he did, you know, some huge percentage of his published work is translations. I don't know, I haven't ever calculated, I said about a third of his, of his published works are translations. But some of them, you know, um, you know, you know, 150 years later, his translation of Dante is still quite readable and quite accurate. You know, I don't think it's quite as good as the Chiardi translation, but it's it's a very reliable translation. A lot of the of the things like he did of Michelangelo and some of the Italian poets are really quite fine. I think they're the best ones ever done in English. Some of the ones from German I think are less good. Um, but a lot of times he would take these things that rhymed Demeter and things like this that are really impossible to bring over, and he did about as good as anybody could. But he's really quite exceptional. I mean, I think there are three great poet translators in American literature, Longfellow, Pound, and Richard Wilbur. Uh, and then you've got a few people whose work as a translator really outshines their, uh, 
their original work, like Robert Fitzgerald, the great translator of the classics. But you know, Longfellow, certainly in the 19th century, is, is the preeminent American translator of poetry with no close second. I guess we'll take one more question. Just a question on your uh, foundation uh, or the, the reading well, program that you, you yes. have. I'm just wondering whether uh, you know you would be doing something with the public schools only because um, I came from a tiny island in the South Pacific, yeah. and uh, when I had my kids, I had asked them what they've learned or, or what they've read in elementary school uh, when they were in high school, yeah. and uh, I I was shocked to find out that, and we're in a you know in a um, highly regarded public school system in Massachusetts. So I was shocked to find out that they haven't read most of what we've read in elementary school and they were already graduated from high school. So don't you think that maybe the public schools <laughs> would no, well, that's, be? I, let me reassure you. Uh, well, first of all, let me not reassure you. Uh, I, I read lots and lots of studies of education, and Massachusetts is, is usually first or second in the nation, you know, in education. has a superb system in this state that this, people should be proud of. If it's not happening here, it's kind of scary uh, because it won't be happening anywhere. Uh, but let me reassure you in that when, when we're, the big read, what we're trying to do here is to take a community and create a partnerships in the communities between the library, the public schools, the local nonprofit media, the mayor's office, uh, the community foundation, and the chamber of commerce, so that over a month, we create a, essentially a festival in, in the town where the book is read in the schools, it's discussed in the libraries, discussed on air, and you might create a situation in which a child reads a book in school and actually sees his or her parents and grandparents reading the same book, actually hears it mentioned on the radio or on television, and we acknowledge some sort of social utility to the things they're studying. Robert Frost once said, uh, children uh, uh, discover that they re hear more about poetry in school than outside of it. They must wonder why. And what we'd like to do is create a situation where a great book is something that a student, his or her parents, neighbors, and grandparents have in common. So. Uh, I share your commitment to public schools and public education and to try to get the next generation of Americans reading. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Dana Joya.